Would you please welcome the Director of Sustainability from Siemens, Jan Rabe. Okay, thanks. Very warm welcome. So you raised the bar already. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Um, uh, and um, also, of course, David, thanks. Um, and also thanks for um, that you actually have created this specialized event on top of the, the should I say, normal curriculum that you are doing anyhow and where we are uh, very proud part, uh, participating. Um, also, um, I can tell you that for Ottawa, the internal application process is running full steam and um, we, will, we will try to bring a cool crowd again. Um, in this main event in, in Ottawa, my, my colleague Marielle will, will speak for, for Siemens and she will be talking about business to society, which is our more broad approach on the impact that we are having as a company, um, optimizing the impact of people, planet, profit. I mean, you all know those sustainability frameworks. Um, yeah, today, more a group of experts, so I will also cut certain things short. And I only want to leave you with three main messages that, that I want you to remember. Uh, first of all, we need to change our perspective how we see decarbonization. And, and, and we need to see it more as the positive business case it is, and not so much as the um, yeah, prevention of the bad business case. Secondly, striving for 100% renewables, I mean, is it, is it a good, good or realistic target? Yeah, I think it's very realistic, um, but, but, but I will show in a second that I believe this is, this is not enough. We rather need to aim for to the tune of 300% renewables. And I will, will, will tell you what I mean. And then the good news is technology will not be the showstopper. And I will show a couple of examples that actually all it takes is more or less already there. And for, 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 the, for the few remaining things, I'm very confident um, that here over time we will also get there. So what, what do we have here? Um, the blue dot, 2015, last year. Um, so was it a good year? Was it a, was, how was the year? Well, I think at least um, in, in, in one aspect, it was a very good year. It was a good year in the way we changed perception on climate change and also create the momentum now to do something about it. Yeah, the year started um, with a G7 summit in uh, actually very close to where I live in, in Bavaria, where Ms. Merkel and her six colleagues concluded on the need to decarbonize the planet over the course of this century. And then the year ended, so to say a few months later, um, with, the, with the Paris Agreement that, and I all know this is not yet binding and needs to be ratified, et cetera, et cetera, but still the result I think is much better than most of us would have thought only a few months ago, or few, yeah, well, and, and two or three years ago, nobody would have thought that the US would chip in, that, that um, countries like China would chip in. I mean, f f for various reasons, I mean, China for pollution reasons, um, but it doesn't matter, I mean, the world is behind at least the target and I know it's still a lot of work. And then also companies have chipped in in the meantime and I mean, I'm mentioning us as an example. So we have been the first large industrial company to commit to a total decarbonization to the end of next decade latest. Internal target is a little earlier, but this is what we commit ex externally. Um, and you have to know that we are... Uh, quite big company with more than 300 factories that we run. So they need to be included in this year. And then uh, also 2015 was mentioned before, SDGs, all of which the fight for climate change is, you know, I think it's fair to say maybe the one really uniting us because um, the, the uh, molecule of, of uh, CO2, wherever it's emitted, it will travel the world and the effects will be um, on a global scale. So good year. Well, Maybe not quite, because on the other hand, I mean, we heard that also before, for the first time, we're we talking about 1.5 or 2 degree targets. Well, 1 centigrade we already have reached. 1 centigrade we have already reached. And it was also mentioning, mentioned before, we passed the 400 ppm just very recently, for the first time. And what's worrying is not only that the effect is getting worse, but also that the acceleration of the negative effect is still increasing. So also last year, sea level rise year on year was the highest ever. 
I mean, we are still talking about point something of millimeters, but it's a number that's increasing, it's a number that's adding up year over year, it's cumul cumulative. So, like Kofi Annan put it in Bangkok, we are still in one boat here and this boat can still sink or hopefully swim. Um, yeah, business case, that's my first point. And typically, we, we all say, yeah, we have to do it because the consequence would be so bad. And, and, and it's totally clear that the cost of inaction is far higher than the cost of action. That's clear. But I'd rather um, also to, to um, Adrian's example of making a sustainable life more cool. I want to look at the positive business case because that's in the business world the equivalent for being more cool is to being more profitable, to being more successful. Um, and so there are always two ways to look at it and I don't want to use the prevention of the bad business case as a reason, but the positive business case of doing what we need to do. And if you look at that, this is a, a picture from London Array, that's the largest wind power plant in the world. We, we, are, um, we already signed contracts, we will build even larger ones, but this is the largest as of today. That's uh, less than 100 miles away from central London, uh, producing the energy of roughly half a nuclear power plant, this, this, this field here. And it has been a very positive business case for everybody involved, for the project developer, made some good money, all the suppliers into that project, many suppliers, one of them being us, we, 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 we did our business, um, but also society profited a lot here because the amount of job creation and other positive effects that this is then uh, giving back to, to, in this case, the UK, um, is immense and far higher than other forms of power generation. And uh, when these, these um, turbines will run out of the subsidy regime in yeah, they have still 12 years to go roughly, then they will still be there for the next 20, 30 years producing electricity for no additional cost. So even if on the short run the cost might be a little higher, in the long run it's actually cheaper. And well, if then still some people are not convinced, then they could, can look at the other side. I mean, we can either put turbines to the water or do other stuff, or we um, have our houses underwater. But again, I, I actually I, I try to avoid the right-hand side because in, in many cases the left-hand side is so convincing and that was also the convincing argument for our board to say ahead of schedule we want to decarbonize. We, I mean, we, we really did, did the math and it's a positive business case. Now, there's one number slide that and we cannot get around the number slide um, from an engineering company. Um, and, but, but, but it's very easy numbers and uh, I made it on purpose very round numbers, but these are the numbers you need to know, you need to memorize them because, because this is important now. As we want to decarbonize, we need to know what is the enemy. And the enemy is 50 gigatons roughly of um, greenhouse gas CO2 equivalent, so it's also other greenhouse gas, but that would be 50 gigatons of CO2. And roughly a quarter comes from agriculture and forestry, and we heard the professor before on, on things that we can do here. Um, we have roughly half of it from transportation, mainly cars, buildings, that's mainly heatings, industrial processes and other stuff. And then I separated electricity, which is another quarter, for the reason that this is where we always say, yeah, we need to, we need to uh, go 100% renewable energy. 1%, that's a lot of hydropower in there, so, so the, the true dispatchable renewables is actually not so big. Um, but a country like Germany is already above one third of its electricity generated out of um, renewable energy, and I'm not worried about going from 21 to 100. But imagine we, we, we get there, then still we have the, the, the upper 75%. So what we need to do is we need to electrify, and the middle part we can more or less electrify everything, or most of it. And even in agricultural processes, there are some, some ideas to, to do so. Um, we need to electrify that so that then with more renewable energy, we can decarbonize that. And logically, that's the only way. I mean, or, or we can choose not to drive cars anymore. But the, the better choice is make electric cars, have wind turbines, have solar panels, whatever, to, to power them, and then um, they would be carbon neutral. That's only the static view. In a dynamic view, of course, we heard that also before, we have two billion people. 
joining us in the course of only a few years. Um, we have still a billion or so people without electricity. So, so the fact that um, population is rising and we want to increase the quality of life for everybody, we can assume more need for energy per se. But our friend is energy efficiency that we can use to basically decompensate and fight against. So for me, the simplified, simplified formula or summary would be electrify everything that can be electrified because that's the only way to then really, in a sustainable way, make it CO2 neutral with renewable energies. And then also do energy efficiency. Um, the, the technological levers that we co uh, contribute here is ele electrification technology, automation that increases efficiency, and digitalization as an overarching layer to accelerate the whole development and, th and the whole sharing, and, and also we, we talked a lot about that. Um, now, the good news is, as I said before, the technology is, is there and, and will not be the showstopper, at least for most of the cases. I picked some few examples, and with that, I don't want to say that it's the only examples or it's the best examples, but it's some examples that I found interesting and that, that Siemens is working on or where we, we are supplier to somebody who is, who is doing the actual solution. Um, that one, electric car, you all know that. Um, well, as a German, I had to pick a German car. Um, in the US, I should have taken a Tesla, maybe. In France, I would take a, a Renault. In, in Japan, uh, a Nissan. In, uh, in China, uh, build your dream. But that's, that's known um, how that works, and, and it's a matter of time when an electric car will even be cheaper than the current conventional cars. Um, I picked an ex another existing example because the, the, the one thing is in the car, in the vehicle, and the other part is in the charging. And, and this bus that you can see here operates on the live city line in Hamburg, Germany. That's the second largest city of our country. And it's a quite busy line. Um, the battery capacity of this, ele this electric bus is as big as um, the battery of a BMW i3 passenger electric car. The passenger car can do 200 miles, the bus can do 30 miles, which is more than enough to go from one terminal station to the other. I mean, German cities are rather dense, not as wide as, for example, here. Um, and then what you can see is a charger that we have developed that can fill up the battery in six minutes. So the poor bus driver, he really needs to hurry up if he wants to go wash his hands or having, have a cigarette, fetch a coffee. Um, his bus would be ready six minutes later. Um, also here, that's a, that's a ship, a ferry boat. And it's the first, it's called Ampere. It's the first electric, uh, fully electric um, ferry boat in, in Norway. Uh, the technology is not very, very complicated. But what's interesting here, um, this concept won the... Uh, competition, even if the competition was technology open. So it wasn't said it has to be an electric ferry. Still, the electric ferry made the case here. And now we have sold another of such uh, propulsion systems to, sw to Sweden to power another ferry. Let's take it to the air, or not quite. And I'm not talking about the uh, Lufthansa Airbus here, but this little thing um, that is called um, the taxi board. That's a company, we are supplying the drivetrain. It's a fully electric uh, and, uh, and also eventually autonomous vehicle that picks up the plane directly after landing, so all my engines shut off, to the terminal, back on the apron, and only on the runway the, the engines will be turned on again. And um, so it, and this saves one ton of kerosene for a larger airline for every ground operation. And the nice thing about it, and that's why the business case is it's paid back after three, four months. Um, it extends the service interval of the, of the gas engine, of the, uh, of the gas turbine, of, 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 the, uh, of the airplane. Um, another example, and now we are really flying electric. This is the strongest electric engine in the world, at least in terms of um, specific power. It has a, this is a five kilowatt per kilogram engine. If you think about it, a typical passenger car has, what, 100 kilowatt, give or take. So that engine would only weigh 20 kilograms. And uh, the engine gearbox of such a car today r roughly would weigh 10 times that much. And it's also three, three times stronger than uh, the electric engine of, of, of an electric car. 
And, and uh, we have already this in smaller planes for sh short term flights. Um, but we just announced uh, a joint venture with Airbus. We are now developing um, a, a, a hybrid system for mid sized aircraft, 100 people, 1,000 mile kind of uh, trips, where, where an electric system will support the, the jet engines, making them smaller and then use less energy. Um, I, I will skip that. I mean, also in industrial processes, we can go away from traditional sort of doing business. Um, this one here, also nice to mention. Next time you travel to Paris, it's very likely that you will use the metro. It's the largest metro in the world. And it's also very likely that you would use this line because that's the line, line uh, so the, the, main, the main line in Paris, which is already equipped. And uh, the next line is being equipped now, fully automated. Um, will make that we can have twice the amount of cars running every hour. They, they have now a 90 second interval. And the energy is uh, minus 30% through the automated driving. And there are some other examples I will skip through that uh, for time reasons because I also want to um, land it at the technology that, they, that we don't have yet. And, and here looking back, this is 34 years ago. This is our first wind turbine, 25 kilowatt, five meter, one blade. We could, when had to drive it to the side with a, with a mini, mini, uh, minivan. Um, now 36 years later, this is our current offshore machine that we, that we are selling and installing in, in large numbers. I could have taken a picture because it's really live installed in the North Sea in Europe but I wouldn't have found a picture where we have a, an A38 flying through, through, the, through the rotor. Um, and now you can ask me, okay, it's 33 years, and you, you can see what happened in this time. Yeah, we have increased the, 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 the rating by a factor of almost 300, um, and the specific weight, by the way, by a factor of 20. So the machine would be 20 times more heavy if we wouldn't have achieved this improvement. Um, and then if you will ask me, uh, how will the wind turbine look in 2050? And I used, that, used to be the head of strategy of that business. I have to tell you, I don't know. I don't know. Well, it will, it, it will be most likely bigger, and there will be variable blades and whatnot. But I don't know. The, the thing that I do know is it will be much better. <laughs> and if you think about it, when, when I was at university, nobody knew anything about wind turbines. When you were at school already, no, I mean, now your age, you can, you can learn uh, direct at university, but at, at your school or, or at least uh, uh, kindergarten times, it was not. But you know, these gentlemen here were of my kids, third, gr third grade, uh, as, as three years old in kindergarten, he's already drawing wind turbines. And on the left-hand side, we had less than 100 people. 10 years ago, we had 800 people. And today we have more than 12,000 people developing the next 34 years. And that is why, even I don't know how it, it will maybe look a little different than what, what Max has been drawing, but it, um, <laughs> it will be much better. So coming to an end, um, at the end it will be you guys for the next, to, to, to develop then the next, um, the next generations. As a summary, like I said, 15 was the turning point from detention. Now we need to also move the numbers in the right direction. We need to electrify everything we can, 300% renewables, energy efficiency so to allow also for, for, for growth. And uh, yeah, the good news is we don't have to be worried. And the way to overcome the implementation hurdle, I think, is to point out the positive business case instead of always saying, yeah, but we have to do it because otherwise the world go down the drain. It, which it would, but 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 this is this is this is uh, where I want to end it. So, zero zero red. I guess that's it. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. <laughs>